All right. Good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about Android graphics. And in the grand tradition of all the talks that we submit, uh, it's a different title. It's probably different content, because usually when we send a talk, we don't know what we're going to talk about. So hopefully, you will like it anyway. So hi, I'm Romain Guy from the Toolkit team. Bonjour, je m'appelle Chad Haas. Et en français, et fini. You worked all night on this. All right, so today we want to talk about graphics, and we're going to go back in time and talk about you know, where our graphics APIs came from, uh, what are some things that are good about them or not so good, what we've been doing over the years, and what we're doing nowadays or in the near future. Uh, so yeah, we're going to start in 2005. So for some reason, I have history on my mind. So when I looked at the state of our graphics APIs, I thought, why are they in the current state? And it was because. In 2005, Google acquired a company called Skia. They needed a rendering engine for Android, and they needed it yesterday. So they just bought the company. All of the rendering capabilities came with it, but it was native code. So uh, they had all these objects in native, uh, SK Canvas, SK Paint. Some of these words may ring a bell. And they wrapped those with J and I. So that created what we currently have, Canvas Paint path classes, and a few others in there. And that was basically it. Uh, that is where they came from, and that's kind of where they stopped for many years. There are various implications of uh, those APIs and the way things worked at that time, especially given the limitations of devices uh, and the constraints that that rendering engine was built under. For example, everything is stateful. So you set a matrix on Canvas, and you then forget about it, and somewhere someone else uh, in the code makes an assumption that there's not a matrix set on the canvas, and that's unfortunate because it's not going to turn out uh, to be the right thing for them. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. Technical difficulties. What do you think? Ah. All right, there we go. Uh, Yes, uh, it's immediate mode, which means I do a thing and it uh, draws immediately. We're not creating a display list in there. We spent many, many years sort of building that infrastructure underneath it, um, but we did need to work around the, the uh, default behavior of Skia uh, capabilities by being, you know, draw this line now. Uh, and there's no allocations, and we'll see some implications of that in the APIs a little bit later. Now it's time for that slide. So one of the things that I've been looking into uh, recently is the paint class, um, which is a good idea in principle. When you have a bunch of attributes, you probably want to collect them somewhere. And instead of having you know, these sort of global things littering the API all over the place. And so for us, that is the paint class. We have some attributes in there which are useful for controlling not what we're going to draw, but how we're going to draw it. So if we look a little bit deeper into the paint class, what's going on there? Uh, so we have, for example, 27 constants, 42 properties, 37 methods. There is a lot of stuff in uh, the paint class. Um, one of my favorite things about the paint class is most of that stuff is just about text. So if you're drawing a line, all of that stuff that you littered the paint object with is irrelevant. Uh, a lot of the functionality, a lot of the constants in there, things like how we want to dash and hyphenate things, uh, just random things that are all about text in this generic paint class that everybody uses for all graphics operations. It's a little weird. And yet, we also have a class called text paint that extends paint. And Which is good in theory. At some point, somebody said, wow, there's a lot of text stuff in there. Let's create a new class that's just for text. And it adds seven fields, not properties, no getters, no setters, just public fields. And yet, there's also hundreds in the base paint class that are also for text. So depending on the stuff that you're looking for, it might be in the subclass or the parent class. And I think nobody knows why. No. <laughs> but we all feel bad about it. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's not great. All right, uh, so I talked about um, setting a matrix on a canvas and some of the side effects you have from that. So uh, another thing that's interesting is not only is canvas stateful, but also it kind of side effects other things. So what do you think happens with this code? So we have a scale on the canvas and we have a stroke width on the paint. Um, so if we think about it graphically, because we're graphics people and this is a graphics talk, we can draw a little Venn diagram. You have canvas over there, you have paint over there, 
And then you have some of the things that they both operate on that are sort of in the middle, uh, overlapping each other. So you have the transform information on Canvas, and then you have things that can be affected by the transform. So in fact, uh, when you draw these things together, when you set that transform and then you set a stroke width, it's not clear what's going to happen with the stroke width because it ends up actually being transformed by the Canvas thing. Separate objects, and yet they combine in really awkward ways. And that's a problem in general. So we, we saw that paint has a lot of stuff on it, and you never really know what's going to be used by which methods on Canvas. Uh, actually, when I re-implemented the Canvas on top of the GPU, I had to literally test every method with all the combinations of paint flags to figure out how this thing works. So here's another example. Let's say you create a, what's called a bitmap shader. You set it on your paint, and you draw a bitmap with that paint that has a bitmap shader. What happens? The, the, the answer depends on the type of bitmap you have. So if your bitmap is an RGB bitmap, which is the most common type of bitmap, then we're going to ignore the bitmap shader. But if your bitmap is grayscale, and it's the type alpha 8 bitmap, then we're going to apply the bitmap shader on your bitmap. Why? Exactly. Uh, and so paint is this giant god object, and it's mostly a state object, and that's fine, right? Like, it can, be, it can have a lot of state. It's not really ideal because sometimes we don't know if we're going to take into account the shader or not. But it also has computation. It also does work for you. So I'm not going to list all the examples, but for instance, you have the API called getTextPath. It's really powerful. It gives you the path that represents the outline for a given text. It's very helpful, but why is that on paint? It has nothing to do with drawing the text. Or you have break text, so that's to do line breaking. So if you want to write a text editor, and you have a piece of text, and you need to break the lines so that you know they all fit on screen, it's on paint. Why? Again, exactly. Everybody has to live somewhere. Uh, all right. So the problem with allocations were, uh, so at the time, if you think back way to 2005 or even 2008 when 1.0 came out, um, allocations were essentially bad. We're on a runtime that takes a lot of time to allocate memory, and it takes even more time to clear it up later, and it would cause hiccups uh, as... For those who haven't heard you know, our talks on the history of Android, Skia came at a time when the CPU we had on our phones was 80 megahertz, uh, and we had 32 megabytes of RAM. So you know, we had to be careful with things like allocations. Uh, so it was good, but um, a lot of those decisions at that time, a lot of those optimizations ended up in the APIs that you currently use today. So there was a lot of attempts to reuse objects through the APIs. So we could, if you call get clip bounds, return a rect, but then we're going to allocate that rect on your behalf. You're probably not going to use it very much. You're going to throw it away, and it'll have to be collected later. So if you're doing this for little micro calls, uh, little micro uh, functionality all over the place in your application, that's a problem with a runtime that takes a long time for allocation and collection. So instead, we offer alternatives for a lot of the methods, or sometimes the only alternative is one where you pass in a mutable object. Mutable, sometime between then and there, became a really bad word. But this is why, right? We have mutable all over our APIs because we wanted to avoid you having to have us allocate something on your behalf. And, and it's also fine to have the choice. The problem is that we need to duplicate every method, right, to give you the choice of do you want us to allocate or do you want to reuse an allocation. So there's a lot more API surface just because of that. Uh, it also ended up in us using primitives for uh, indicating flags where it might be more natural for people to think in terms of objects or enums because ints are cheaper. Not only that, but bit fields are cheaper. So on view.java, last time I looked, we had an, an internal uh, bit flag for private flags that we use um, called private M private flags. Uh, we also ran out of space there, yeah, so we then we... Now. We had M private flags too, and then we ran out of space there and got M private flags. I think we're up to five now, actually. We are? Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's been a while. Uh, so uh, I, I should point out too, I, enum is sort of a trigger word for many of us. We still don't use that in our APIs for the most part because there is actually a good reason beyond the allocation reason uh, originally, which is uh, binary, API. Binary compatibility. Yeah, binary compatibility. If we need to add something to it later, it tends to cause a problem. So we're still going to avoid enums, but some of those original things that triggered all the bit flags uh, have gotten less important over the years. Uh, so, yeah, we also...
tend to use primitives all over the place, not just for bit flags, but we tend to prefer ints and floats versus objects. So we do have a draw rect that takes a rect, but we also have one where you can just pass in floats. Same thing, then you don't have to allocate a rect object, hand it to us, and then it needs to get collected later. So all of this shouldn't be new to anybody using these APIs, but this is the reason why, right? This is kind of an old world style of programming, but it comes from those original constraints in the platform. So setting aside all those issues, uh, you know, we have this Canvas API and you can do a lot of interesting stuff. So the nice thing is that on Android, drawing was super easy, right? You create a, 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 a view class, you extend view, you create, well, four constructors, really, because you want to be able to use it from XML, then you have to override on measure to be able to give yourself a size, uh, and then you override the draw method, and that's it, you're done. You can finally draw something on screen. I don't know why more people don't do custom graphics on Android. Yeah, that's quite a puzzle. Um, another interesting thing that we have, um, so in Skia, we have the ability to do 3D transforms, and I'm using giant air quotes, uh, because you have an example here, I feel bad, actually, I took that from a recent demo that was published uh, officially by, by the Android team. So if you look at the 3D effect, it looks a little strange when, when the rotation is at a steep angle. Uh, it, it's like a little bit wobbly. It's not actual 3D, and that's the problem. We have those 3D rotation APIs, but it's not a 3D engine under the hood, so it's all fake. Uh, and it's really a shear and a skew, so we're basically compressing the bitmap. And it works just fine when you do a quick animation, you know, you want to flip a card on screen, that's great. But when you do something that's a little slower, like this, and you use those like high angles of rotation, it starts looking a little funky. The, the weird thing about this, though, is internally in Skia, so they didn't have 3D matrices at the time, which is why we have this limitation constraint in the Canvas APIs. But actually, they use 4x4 four four matrices now. Years ago, they put in full-on 3D matrices, but they're under the hood at the native level, and they never made it up to the API level that we're all using. All right, uh, so we also have this issue about um, opaque objects where you can create them with information and that information is not possible to get back from them. We'll just keep it secret internally. Um, so for example, you can create a path, you give it operations and data, you pass that stuff in, it goes down to Skia, and that's the last you're gonna hear of it. You can draw that path, but you can't find out what's in it. Uh, linear, or set matrix, same thing, you can set the matrix, I don't know what the matrix is. This is especially a problem given the statefulness that we talked about before because someone can set a matrix over here and then in this code over there, you can't say, hey, what matrix do you currently have? It just doesn't exist. We could, but we haven't. Uh, linear gradient is one of many objects where, again, you construct it with a bunch of parameters. Here are all the stops. Here's the colors you need to go between, and that's it. It's only in the constructor. It's not properties that we expose. And even more recently, in the Android T release, we have this awesome API for using uh, AGSL, Android Graphic Shading Language. You can create a runtime shader. You can do really amazing per-pixel stuff. We'll see a little bit of that later. Uh, and again, you create it with a shader, and then it's gone. You pass in a string, and nobody knows where it is because Skia kept it down for itself. Uh, there's also uh, a distinct lack of documentation for some APIs. My favorite uh, was a class called Camera. I think I finally documented that a few releases ago because it was really annoying that it had zero, zero documentation on the class, the method, the properties, everything about it. Uh, what was especially annoying was it wasn't a camera at all. It was a camera in the sense of like 3D programming camera frustum. It was, it's the thing that we're using for those uh, fake 3D effects on the card flip, and it was not clear at all what it did, so it needed some kind of documentation. But uh, this problem hasn't been fixed um, for many of the other things. So I was looking at dashing uh, paths and lines recently and see how people are doing that or how they should be doing it, and to do that, you use this path-path -path effect dot style, and then one of the enums that comes, or one of the, the ints that comes with that, that you can specify, and here they are. And that's the documentation. So you can do a morph, a rotate, or a translate. Well, I have no idea what I would like to point out mean. that it's self-explanatory because morph does a morph, rotate, rotates, and translate, translates. So I don't know what you want from that. <laughs> if only he had been there at the time, it would have been a lot easier. All right, so here's another example. You may have used it, the color matrix. Uh, I see PY who has dealt with that. So what does this do? You know, do you have any idea? Well, I know, but I know you don't know. How about this one? 
So we can look at the documentation. There is documentation, and you are presented with this helpful information. Here's a matrix with a bunch of letters, and here's a bunch of equations. We're not going to give you any example, uh, so good luck with that. Uh, anyway, so we, we talked about a lot of problems. The good news is that there are also very powerful things you can do with the Canvas APIs. It's actually been interesting lately to see you know, everyone start using Compose, and I've seen all those fantastic demos and animations and really cool visual effects, and every time I see them, like, you could do that in Android 1.0. Uh, the APIs were already there. It's just they were so horrible to use that nobody apparently cared. So here are a few examples of things you can do that are interesting that you might not be aware of. Uh, so here we have a path. It's just a sinusoid. Uh, we have the code to draw the path. That's not very interesting. But then we have this API called Path Measure. And on Path Measure, you can find a lot of interesting features. For instance, there's the beautifully named uh, get pause tan, so it gives you the position and the tangent. Apparently, characters were very expensive in 2005, so we're uh, trying to save a few. Uh, so that will give you, that, that helps you, like, so the little boat that you see that's following the waves, it's using that API to know where we can draw the boat and how to rotate it so it can follow the path. Uh, we also, also have a method called get segment. So that lets you get a subsection of the path. So you can see here the waves are like growing and shrinking. This is done by going, calling get segment. Uh, you basically give it a value between zero and the length of the path, and we give you a new path that contains only that part of the original path. And finally, so Chet mentioned the path dash path effect uh, that we renamed to the stamped path effect in Compose. So this is Compose code. And what it do, this does is that you can take a path and you can repeat it along another path. So we started with the sinusoid, and I have this little icon of waves, and they're being stamped all over the original path, and that's how we create this effect. And here we're using the morphing, because as you can see, the waves morphs, morph along the path. Pretty obvious. And with those APIs, you can do you know, more advanced things. So this is a demo I wrote several years ago, but you, know, you can do this kind of, of reveal. So it just loads SVG, file, uh, SVG files, and then it uses get segment to draw uh, with an animation. You can also combine all of that with the get text path that you can find on Paint. Um, so you have a, a path for the, for the text, and then you can combine all those features to do something that you know, probably you won't do in your application, but I'm sure you can be creative and come up with something cool, uh, cooler than this. We also have Boolean operations on path, where you can add, subtract, intersect paths together. So here, this is an example where if you want the underline to not cut through the descenders of the text, we don't want the underline to go through the, the G and the Y and the P. Um, so you can use the underline as a path, so as a line, and you can subtract the text from it, and that gives you a new path that has holes in it, so that you can get this uh, more beautiful version of underline. So I will return to color filter, which we saw earlier in a confusing matrix. You are matrix, kind of obsessed with them. Uh, and bad documentation. So I was looking into filters in the last couple of years to figure out what we did and didn't have. And, and the answer is mostly we don't have filters, but there's, there's some very powerful things that you can do with the simple color filters that we have. The, the constraint that we have with our current filters is you can vary each pixel color, but that's kind of it. You, you can't do more complicated things that take account for the pixels surrounding it until we get to the runtime shader stuff that I was talking about earlier. Um, so they're, they're very limited in what they can do, but they're kind of powerful for at least uh, varying the colors of the pixels. So I wanted to return to that and say, okay, well, maybe that's poorly documented and hard to understand, but uh, once you actually do understand, you can do pretty interesting things. Um, so here's essentially the qu equation that you get out of my favorite named class, color matrix color filter, just because it's so long and repetitive. Uh, and then what do you get out of that? It's not really clear uh, what is going on there. So if we take a look again at what's going on, so we have this matrix, 16 values there. These are the equations. Again, I'm not exactly sure what's going to come out of that. Um, so we're going to see a demo later that makes it a little bit clearer. But in the industry, there's standards for doing CPU tone. You can do a web search, and you'll end up with an equation that looks like this. Again, not exactly clear what's going on, although you, you phrased it in terms of what desaturating and uh, amping up the, the scale. brown tint. Uh, and if we take those numbers and plug it into the equation there and then say, okay, where do they fit in the matrix? Basically, this is how you populate a matrix that you pass into color matrix color filter to get a result something yeah, like that. And if that. you do all that, you can call back your math teacher from high school and tell them what you've been up to and be, they will be very proud of you. 
Uh, we have two other filters that are worth a look. One is lighting color filter, uses another equation that may not be obvious. You give it two colors in addition to this image, uh, and you apply that, and basically one color is used um, to multiply the, each pixel value in your image, and the other is then added to it and then clamped at the end. Again, I'm not exactly sure what the result well, is going to be. What's particularly silly is that you can do this with the color matrix color filter. So I don't know why we have both. <laughs> Okay, maybe it's because it's simpler? Is, it, is this simpler? I don't know. Uh, all right, and then finally we have blend mode color filter, uh, which is a combination of a color that you give it. It's going to be used as a source pixel. If you're used to blending things in general, that is the source, and then you have this blend mode that's going to operate on the source and the desk, the desk being the image. And once again, it's not exactly clear how these things are going to interact. Um, so let's go to a demo. I find it... Uh, much easier to actually play with this thing uh, live to see what is happening. All right. So, yep. yep it's there. Oh, it's We're good. Sorry. Ah. Nope. There it is again. Of course, you the screens. So there it is on the screen. Uh, so there's a demo that I wrote, um, and I pushed it to GitHub because I, I kind of thought it was useful in general. So if you want to check it out there, so you can click sepia tone, and it plugs in those values, and you can see where they are in the matrix there. You can do grayscale, you can do inverse, and you can sort of see what the values are there. More importantly, you can take these and actually drag the value around to see what effect they have. Uh, so uh, this is the best one. So we have all these like zero to one values on the left unless you want to make them negative. You can also make them negative. Like they could be any floating point value, but in general, negative one to one over there. But the values on the right, that's more like color values, uh, ints from zero to 255. Again, not intuitively obvious, which is why it's kind of useful to actually have a demo to play around with this. And then the lighting filter, you can play around with uh, changing the multiplier color. Uh, as well as uh, the color that's being added at the end to sort of see what the effect is. And then blend modes, uh, you could do a, let's see, and change this to be a difference, and then change that. Oh, yeah, you change the alpha value. I like that one. Uh, I think that's the upside down. Uh, all right, uh, let's go back to... Slides. Um, so I'll have a link to that later. If you want to play around with these filters, I'd suggest you either do something like that or just check out the code uh, and the app and play around with it because it, it helped me understand what was actually going on underneath. And even with something that you've all probably used, uh, gradients. So with gradients, when you use them in creative ways, you can do something way more complicated, like this beautiful uh, trading card that I built for Android <laughs> makers. Uh, so this is the combination of a, of a couple of gradients. One is combined, so we have this image of holograms. So the first gradient is used to uh, mask the holograms, and there's a second gradient that's used as, as lightning. So lighting, so that's what you see on the screen here. We draw a rectangle with a gradient that has uh, a couple of colors, and we use the overlay blend mode uh, to create an interesting lighting effect. And the 3D rotation is done using that camera API that we mentioned. But you can see that I keep the rotation small, so that it looks correct. All right, so what have we done? So this is what was good about our APIs, what was bad about our APIs, but what have we done to Im improve those APIs? Because all the APIs we've talked about have been in Android since 1.0. So we started in 2006 with the introduction of Scan Canvas. Uh, then we shipped Android 1.0 and you started using all those APIs. And then uh, the next thing we did really for graphics was for Android 3.0 in 2011. That's when we moved the implementation of Canvas to the GPU, just purely for performance. So you couldn't do anything new, but you could do it faster. And then nothing happened for quite a while uh, until 2017, I think that was Android 8. Um, so the two things we introduced, uh, there was color spaces, so that was the support for white color gamuts. Uh, something that I'm sure none of you have been using, but you should, because it's awesome. And hardware bitmaps. Um, so hardware bitmaps, since the introduction of the GPU support, when you have a bitmap, it lives in RAM, and we have to make a copy in the GPU memory. So you pay the cost twice for that bitmap, which gets really expensive, because our devices have really high-resolution screens, bitmaps are massive, takes a lot of RAM. With hardware bitmap, you can load a bitmap that lives only in GPU memory. So if you never need to read the content of the bitmap, that's a much more efficient way of doing things. 
Uh, and then a couple more years without nothing happening, and we introduced blend modes in Android 11. And blend modes are really just the, an existing API that was called Porter Duff XFER modes. So XFER also like a horrible name, uh, abbreviation for transfer mode. Uh, and this Porter Duff API contained 12 nodes that were defined by two people called Porter and Duff, hence the name Porter Duff. But it also contained a bunch of nodes that were not Porter Duff modes. So we finally fixed that by creating an API called Blend Mode. You have the same names, except now the name Blend Mode uh, makes a little more sense. Here's the problem with APIs. You can't delete the old stuff. All you can do is add more. Well, we could, but then they would all complain, and that would be <laughs> annoying. And they're like, oh, my app is broken again. Uh, then we, we added render effects. So in Android 12, it took us you know, a few years to give you the ability to create blurs. So with render effects, you can blur a view, or you can blur a bitmap. Uh, that, that, that took a while. Uh, and here's an example of how you use those, those blurs. So that's a regular UI. You create a, render, uh, a blur effect. Uh, you set it on a view. Uh, we also support it on Windows, so you can blur what's behind the window. But you can set it on any view, and then we're going to blur the content of this view. So here, we blur just the, the grid of images. Uh, then, uh, fairly quickly after that, in Android 13, we added runtime shaders. Uh, so runtime shaders are more low-level graphics that you might be used to if you haven't done GPU programming. Uh, you basically write a program called a shader that runs for each pixel on screen and is executed by the GPU. It's a bit complicated, but it opens the door to very interesting effects. So here you can see a runtime shader operating on the label at the bottom. It's using this um, fairly simple effect that uses a combination of gradients uh, to, um, with some other stuff that, that changes the lighting in this translucent uh, uh, field there. Basically, the, the, the shader app up at the top, most of which is commented out, is just a string that you pass in. It gets compiled into a program that runs on every single pixel. And it basically checks, where am I inside of this rectangle that I was uh, told to draw into? And therefore, how does that affect the math that I'm about to produce and the resulting color that I'm going to send back? The shaders can be used not just to filter something, like you do with a blur or this effect. You can use shaders to just create, you know, you can do generative art effectively. So here we have a couple examples. So on the left, you can see at the top there's this animated sweeping wavy gradient. That's rendered exclusively using one of those shaders. Uh, it's not using the gradient classes from Android. Uh, it's all based in shaders. And then on the right, you can see an example of, it's a, an alarm clock application, a demo I wrote. And this is using a bunch of like, very uh, scary equations to generate the sky at any given time at any location on Earth that's physically accurate. And you can do all of this using a shader that you can use uh, via a render effect. All right, so we here on Android, um, I don't know if you've noticed in any conferences in the last five, six, seven years. We enjoy saying the phrase modern Android a lot, so we'd like to say it again today. Uh, now we'd like to talk about stuff that we are doing now and, and in the future to improve the graphics state on Android, and we call it modern Android graphics, uh, which is MAG, which doesn't really make sense uh, as an acronym, so instead we'd like to say modern Android um, once more, and we'd like to say modern Android graphics, modern Android which is magma. Welcome to magma. It's way more cool. Um, so one of the obvious things that we've been doing over the past five years was uh, start using Kotlin. And Kotlin is fantastic for graphics programming because of some of the features that come with the language and with the standard library. So an example uh, is the ability to use default parameter values. Uh, remember, when we want to avoid allocations, we need to create two versions of each API, one that gives you the allocation and one where you pass an object. With default values, we can have a single API that do both at the same time. If you don't want to give us an object, we'll allocate for you. And if you give us an object, we'll reuse it, and it's a much better API. Uh, then there's a number of things in the standard library, like you know, apply with and all those little uh, utility functions that make it a lot easier to deal with initializing those large st state objects like the paint. You don't have to say paint dot every, every single time. You need to set one of those, uh, those properties. Uh, Kotlin also lets you do overloading of operators, uh, and that is great when you do math. Uh, so this is an example of code uh, actually for the demo with the, the sky in this alarm clock application, that's the Kotlin bits I was using, where I'm using a class that I wrote called float3, so it's a vector of three floats, 
And if you read the code, you can see that we're doing multiplications and exponentials and additions on those objects. And it makes a lot of sense to read the code this way as opposed to calling, you know, dot add, dot multiply. It makes the code a lot cleaner. We also introduced shortly after Kotlin uh, the concept of the core extensions uh, in Android X and Jetpack. And a bunch of those extensions, so in the, pack in the, uh, the library core KTX, we have a series of extensions that are dedicated to graphics. So this is an example of a piece of code that's using, that's using a lot of those extensions. The first one, for instance, is a top-level function called create bitmap, where you pass the width and the height of the bitmap. And unlike the bitmap.create API that comes with Android, you don't have to tell us every single time that you want your bitmap to be an RGB bitmap, because of course that's what you want. So we have a default value that does that for you. Then you can use dot app apply canvas. It creates a canvas for you, so you can start drawing into the bitmap. You don't have to like, do the whole dance of creating the canvas. With translation, lets you uh, save and restore the state automatically, so you don't have to remember to call restore and, and mess up your, your state. Uh, and then we have the use of operator overloading. So if you look at the donut variable, it's taking two paths, uh, so P1 and P2, and it's subtracting, subtracting one path from the other, right? So it's doing a Boolean operation on the path uh, using an API that's a lot clearer than the dot up method. Yeah, that's also a fantastic name, path dot up. It's an operation. <laughs> yeah, no naming sometimes. Um, and finally, we use the, uh, uh, the get accessor, uh, so the array notation, to be able to read the value from one of the pixels inside the bitmap. So you pass the coordinates of the, the pixel you want to read, and we return that value. Uh, and at the, at the bottom, finally, you can see that we use destructuring. So if you have a pixel value, a color value as an int, you know, sometimes you want to see the red, the green, and the blue values, and we have static methods for that, or you have to do like some bit shifting and masking, or you can just write, you know, val r, comma g, comma, g, comma b equals the, the value, and that's it. We're going to give you the channels a lot easier. The next one, Jetpack Compose. Uh, we made things a little, little easier. So if you remember with views, it was a bit complicated to start drawing on screen. With Compose, this is all you have to do. Uh, and if you've never looked at the implementation of the Canvas uh, component in, in Compose, you might be surprised. Canvas is just a spacer, so it's really a widget that, that has a size but doesn't do anything. And on it, we set a modifier. So we have three modifiers you can use to render on any widget. And that's the cool thing about Compose. You don't need to create a new component. You can take an existing component, and you can draw on top of it or behind it. So the first one is a draw behind. It gives you a canvas, a draw scope, and you can start drawing behind the current, the current widget. You can use draw with content. Uh, it gives you access to the draw content method, so that, that renders the actual widget itself. And then you can draw before or after it. And that's a very easy way to create fancy effects, uh, like we saw with the, uh, this trading card uh, and the holographic effect. And finally, there's draw with cache. It's basically draw with content, except we give you the ability to do all your allocations uh, in a place that's not going to be invoked on every frame, so that you can you know, uh, do performance code. Uh, we talked about path being uh, opaque objects, so once you create a path, you don't know what's in it, uh, but it can be very helpful to, to, to look into that. So in Android U, finally, we have a new API on path. So if you create a path and you call the path, the get path iterator method, we'll give you a list of segments that will give you, that will tell you like what each segment is. Is it a line? Is it a curve? Uh, and then you can get, obviously, the points for that curve. Uh, we've also backported this uh, with Android X. It goes all the way back to Andro uh, API 21. And uh, it's even easier to use. So with the Kotlin notation, you could just say for each segment in a path, uh, then you, you, get the, you get the data. Uh, and we can do very interesting things with this kind of API. So this is a, a small library I wrote called V9. If you remember nine patches, this is nine patches, but with vectors, with path. Uh, so you get the benefit of both worlds, where you get the device, uh, the density independence of vectors, and it's also really small inside your APK. But then you can stretch the path and preserve some of the features. Like if you have a chat bubble, uh, you can just uh, stretch the inside of the bubble, so you don't have to yourself recompute the path on every frame. So something else we're doing uh, related to paths is a library that we released recently, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's currently in alpha called uh, graphics-shapes. Um, so we had this request from the design group that said uh, it would be really nice if we could 
make uh, it easier to create rounded polygonal shapes, not just round rect, but also more interesting things. Um, but also, doesn't that rounding suck on draw round rect? And can we do something better than we currently have there? Uh, and wouldn't it be great if we could actually do that in Android X so that it supports older versions instead of just future platform versions? And by the way, we'd really love to animate between those shapes automatically and quickly. Uh, so there is a new library out there. I invite you to check it out. Um, we're still iterating a little bit on the API, but the fundamentals are all there. Um, so the way it works is, if you think about it, a regular polygon is essentially uh, an object with a center and a radius that goes um, to the outside where all the vertices lie on that same radius. So you can create one of these very easily, say rounded polygon, and here's the number of vertices that you need. Uh, you can also create a star polygon by giving it not one radius, but two radii. So if you give it an inner radius as well, then that sets up where the uh, vertices on the inside of the star are going to be. Uh, again, simple ABI call, give me a star, five vertices, and an inner radius. Uh, and then we have a concept called rounding polygon, rounded polygons, and that's where it gets a little more interesting. Um, so we have all the parameters that I showed you before, the basic geometry, but we also have these rounding parameters, corner rounding, that describe how we're going to round uh, around all of the inner and outer vertices. Um, or you can also treat each vertex uh, separately and round them individually. So there you have uh, the radius, the inner radius, and then the rounding uh, you want to specify as well as the number of vertices. Um, in addition to rounding, we're not just doing the circular round because that is essentially why draw a round rec sucks because you, you have a circle, you have a straight edge hitting a circle and there's a little discontinuity where it hits there and there's also not a very interesting curve around there. It's not flexible at all. Um, so instead, we offer alternatives here. So you can get, by default, it gives you circular rounding. It is good enough for many cases. But if you want something more interesting, you can ask for a smoothing factor. And then it's going to use not just one circular path around the middle, but three cubic curves uh, that help you round in a more interesting way. So it's a little hard to see the difference there. And that the difference in the white shape on the right is super subtle. Um, so we can zoom in on this. First of all, that's how you create one of these rounding structures. Uh, if we zoom in, there's what the circular round looks like. The circular arc uh, hits the edge at that one point, the, an anchor point of a cubic curve. But if we're using smoothing factor instead, you can see the white dashed line where the perfect circle is, but smoothing actually dies in a little before that and creates a more interesting subtle curve. Again, a little bit hard to see, but if you look right there, that's where the discontinuity is. That's where the circle hits the edge, and it just kind of uh, it jars a little bit. People that are super picky about graphics look at that and go, Ugh, can we do something better? And uh, now we have. Um, so as I said, everything is created with cubic Bezier curves. and uh, We use path internally to draw these things, and you can request that path if you want to query what's in there. Uh, and it is supported on all Android X releases going way back. Um, could run a demo here, probably faster to uh, play a video here. You can see as we edit the shapes, uh, uh, the, another GitHub demo I posted out there, I invite you to check out. Um, so you can basically play with all the parameters that are calling the APIs that I showed uh, earlier. And I think that gets the point across. We'll keep moving here. All right. Um, so we also can morph these things because they ask for animation. Turns out morphing is hard. Uh, if you want to go from a three-sided object to a four-sided object, that's actually doable. Like, that's pretty straightforward to figure out. Maybe it's a little tedious to write the code. There's going to be some geometry in there. I'm sorry about that, but it's fairly straightforward. If you want to morph this, Good luck. Um, you can do something, and it's going to look horrible if you're doing it automatically. Um, this is basically a design time problem. There are interesting uh, tools out there to help you do stuff like this. Certainly, animation tools like After Effects. There's also a tool by Alex Lockwood called Shapeshifter that basically lets you define how but the animation is going to happen. But also, just don't. Yeah, yeah. This is maybe not an animation to do, but it is essentially an unsolved research problem how to do this automatically. So we said. For our morphing, we're going to have some simplifying assumptions to make it work. First, all of our shapes are going to be contiguous. We're not going to have 
a, a continent of Europe where you, know, you pick up the pencil and you put it down somewhere else and you pick it up and you move it somewhere else instead. You can move once and then you draw around the polygon and that's it. Uh, all the vertices proceed around in order. Uh, you're not gonna have self-intersecting shapes there. And there, therefore, it creates a similar structure for any shape. Every shape is going to consist of a single move operation and a series of cubic curves. And then it's just a trick of figuring out how to align these things and then split the curves and create more internally so that they end up with the same number of curves. And then it's just an easy interpolation uh, equation to animate them. Um, so uh, you can automorph fairly easily. So here's basically the APIs you would call. You'd create the shapes as I was showing before. And then the morph simply takes a start shape and an end shape and then you animate a property called progress, and you're done. Um, so again, we can see a little demo. Let's play the video instead of running the demo live. Um, and this is just, this is some of the canonical shapes that we have in the demo. Again, check out the demo code to see how it works. Uh, but you can see all the animations look pretty decent. Um, this, there's, this is a viewing mode where it's a debug mode where you can see the cubic curves underneath if you want to. Uh, all right. And so we focused on canvas and paint, and there's a lot more that we've been doing uh, more in low-level graphics. So we introduced the CameraX library to help you with the, you know, the camera that you think about, not the camera that Chad found in our, our APIs. Uh, ExoPlayer to help you v with video. We haven't talked about OpenGL and Vulkan. Uh, so you know, a lot more has been going on, but those are m the main APIs that you care about in applications. Uh, and so going forward, there are more things we'd like to do. Uh, so for instance, for Path, there are still a number of features that we'd like to expose. For instance, if you want to do heat testing, let's say you want to have a, v a component in your UI that's star-shaped using the new uh, shape library. If you want to be able to do drag and drop of that, by default, we only let you figure out if you touch the inside of a rectangle. But wouldn't be nice if on Path you could say like, oh, is this point inside the actual star? So no, this is the kind of stuff we'd like to expose and there are many more more improvements in the shapes library that we have in mind, some API additions, including being able to morph between arbitrary paths. As I said, unsolved research problem, but you can at least hand us uh, path objects that are trying to do the right thing. We should be able to animate them in a decent way. Uh, and then I'm currently working on a project to think about what we could do to sort of up-level Canvas, put it in Android X, make it stateless, fix some of those early constraint problems that resulted in the APIs that we currently have. Wouldn't it be nice if there wasn't a paint object with so much text stuff in it? So we're way out of time, uh, but the conclusion, uh, use what you got. We have a lot of really, really powerful APIs that date all the way back to Android 1.0, and you can build a lot of very interesting effects already, so check them out. Uh, check out the new libraries, the new APIs that we've been working on, because they unlock even more interesting things. Uh, look out for what's coming next. Uh, we don't know when they're going to land, but we're going you know, to do a better job, uh, unlike what happened between 2011 and 2017 when nothing happened. Uh, and of course, uh, APIs are hard, uh, so maybe we should stop doing APIs, actually. <laughs> and that's it for today, so thank you very much. And here are a few links, so if you want to check out the demos, uh, they're going to appear on screen, and Chet wrote a couple of articles on Medium about the new shape library and the morphing, so if you're interested, go read those articles, they explain everything you need to know. And that's all. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>